This video discusses monsters, the critical concept of abjection in the category of the human. Monsters as Victor's initial reaction when he encounters the animated creature suggests scare and disgust us. Monsters make us scream in fright and they even might nauseate us. And yet we love them. Horror films, horror TV shows, horror books, are immensely popular. To begin to understand why we react to monsters the way we do, I am going to discuss the theoretical concept known as abjection, which is one of the ideas, along with romanticism, from this module that may be on the final. Abjection is a critical and scholarly term for what horrifies, disgusts, and scares us. Pause for a moment and come up with either a monster, ideally one that actually freaks you out, or something that completely grosses you out. It could be food or something related to the body, for example. Please jot it down in your notes. You could draw it if you like and keep that example as a reference as I discuss abjection. A good starting point for understanding objection is the very orderly, binary thinking we've been engaging with since the start of this course. It is through such dualisms, organized together in grids and systems, that societies are made meaningful. Indeed, it is through such systems that societies themselves come into being. Consider, for example, chapter one of Equiano's narrative and how the African culture he describes very much functions in terms of dualisms, especially gendered binaries, in which women and men are sorted out into different spaces. Consider also the book of Leviticus in the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament and its stress on rules and categories. These sorts of systems endeavor to clean up and organize what is in reality a messy world. Consider gender, for example. We all know that the reality of gender is something far messier than a male-female binary. We also all know that women are not, in fact, inferior beings to men, just as Africans are not inferior to Europeans. In other words, there is a significant gap between how a society organizes life and the reality of existence. The people living in a particular society usually view the world, their world, in terms of its systems and not in terms of the actual messiness and even incoherence of that world. Now I'm going to give you the bottom line on abjection, so do write this down. Abjection functions by violating systems and their rules. Abjection disrespects binaries, grids, orderings, and systems. Typically, abjection involves trespassing a border or mixing what quote-unquote should be properly separated according to a particular social order. Consider your example of a monster or something that grosses you out. How does it violate some kind of order or border? How does it mix what should be separated or cross a line that should never be crossed? Warning, I'm going to get a bit gross now. One example of abjection is a cut, especially a cut from which a bone, blood, or pus is oozing out. Skin is a charged boundary like other borders or orifices of the body that we tend to be very anxious about. Seeing a bleeding sore disturbs us due to its violation of boundaries, namely what should be inside the body is now outside. Namely, in the same way that vomiting disturbs us, what should be inside is now outside the body. Or to reverse things, the thought of putting something inside us that shouldn't be there 
that is the thought of perhaps eating something that we despise, also disgusts and scares us. It's also abject. One of the fascinating things about abjection is that the violation need not be very big. It can be quite small, like a speck. For example, a speck of black mold on a large bowl filled with potato salad. Why do such small transgressions so disturb us, even make us lose control of ourselves? We might even vomit. They do so because objection, no matter how minor, exposes, hints at, the fictive nature of the very societal systems we use to make the world as we know it, and indeed, understand ourselves as meaningful entities in that world. In abjection, we witness the shattering of our world and ourselves. Abjection is thus immensely powerful. It threatens to destroy entire social systems and identities. To develop our thinking about abjection further, let's look at the etymology of the term monster. Monster comes from two Latin words, monstrare, which means to show and to reveal, and monere, which means to warn. What does a monster reveal, display, or warn? A monster warns of and reveals. Category crisis. In other words, it's abject. As medievalist Geoffrey Jerome Cohen puts it in a book he wrote about monstrosity, a monster threatens to destroy not just individual members of a society, but the very cultural apparatus through which society is created. Cultural apparatus here refers to the sorts of systems, binaries, grids, and so forth we've been discussing. I also have some quotes from two important theorists of horror and objection. Here are two quotes from French theorist Julia Kristeva, who writes that abjection or horror disturbs identity, system, order. What does not respect borders, positions, rules. Kristeva also writes that what is abject draws me toward the place where meaning collapses. Secondly, here is a quote from anthropologist Mary Douglas in her amazing book, Purity and Danger. Douglas links abjection to filth, a move that resonates with the way that social systems involve cleaning up a messy world. Douglas writes that thinking about abjection involves reflection on the relation of order to disorder, Being to non-being, form to formlessness, life to death. Such a quote clarifies the immense power of horror and the abject. I'll end with a slight twist. At the same time that the abject or horror is powerful and scary, it can also be exciting and pleasurable. The dissolving of boundaries can at times be immensely enjoyable. And it may be exciting and liberating to consider an objection that aims at the sorts of offensive binaries we first discovered in relation to Chaucer's England, and not only persisted into Mary Shelley's England, but lingered today. Consider, for example, the status of woman as a monster in medieval England, a position that pertained to weird ideas about human development menstruation. The medieval idea of woman as a monster reveals how notions of monstrosity are relative and are social constructs. So when analyzing abjection and monstrosity, do ask yourself, according to whose standards and ideas is something monstrous in the first place? That is, what social categories, systems, and rules does the monster violate? Is monstrosity in the eye of the beholder? Is monstrosity relative? Does monstrosity point us 
to alternate identities? Does the seeming danger posed by a monster actually point the way toward liberation from a rigid, wrong-headed, and oppressive system?